All right, so I was kindly sent a, a bunch of articles on the topic of male affection and the ambiguity of it by a reader. So I wanted to read a couple of these and, and provide some commentary, perhaps. Uh, so the first is Male Affection, a Photographic History Tour. Uh, and I, you know, hope to put these uh, into the uh, video. Uh, if not, just click through and you'll see the pictures. Uh, as you make uh, your way through the photos below, many of you will... Uh, undoubtedly feel a keen sense of surprise. Some of you may even recoil a bit and, uh, and, and you, as you think, holy smokes, that's so gay. The poses, the facial expressions, and body language of the men below will strike the modern viewer as very gay indeed. But it is crucial to understand that you cannot view these photographs through the prism of our modern culture and current conception of homosexuality. The term homosexuality was, in fact, not coined until 1869, and before that time, the strict dichotomy between gay and straight did not yet exist. Not true. Uh, that's my commentary. Uh, attraction to and sexual activity with other men was thought of as something you did, not something you were. It was behavior accepted by some cultures and considered sinful by others. But at the turn of the 20th century, the idea of homosexuality shifted from a practice to a lifestyle and an identity. You did not have the temptations towards a certain sin. You were a homosexual person. Thinking of men as either homosexual or heterosexual became common. And this new category of identity was at the same time pathologized, decried by psychiatrists as a mental illness, by ministers as a perversion, and by politicians as something to be legislated against. As this new conception uh, of homosexuality stig uh, as a stigmatized and onerous identifier took root in American culture, men began to be much more careful to not send messages to other men and to women that they were gay. And this is the reason why, it is theorized, men have become less comfortable with showing affection towards each other over the last century. Not true yet again. Uh, at the same time, it also may explain why in countries with a more conservative religious culture, such as in Africa or the Middle East, where men do engage in homosexual acts, but still consider homosexuality the crime that cannot be spoken, it remains common for men to be affectionate with one another and comfortable with things like holding hands as they walk. Whether the men below were gay in the way our current culture understands the idea or in the way that they themselves understood, it is unknowable. What we do know is that the, the men would not have thought their poses and body language had anything at all to do with that question. Mm, not true yet again. What you see in the photographs was common, not rare, and photos are not about sexuality, but intimacy. Okay, so there's about three comments that I want to make on this. And the first one is uh, the idea that homosexuality was not coined until 1869. It's, it was, before that, it was, um, it was an act, not, uh, not a, um, not a sexual orientation. The, it's something that some men did, as opposed to who they were. That comes from uh, the French philosopher Michael Foucault. Uh, and I've actually uh, quoted him uh, in footnote 199 in Guerrero, and I'll read a little bit of that. So he says, We must not forget that the psychological, psychiatric, medical category of homosexuality was constituted from the moment it was characterized. Westfall's famous article of 1870 on contrary sexual sensations can stand as its date of birth, less by a type of sexual relations than by a certain quality of sexual sensibility, a certain way of in inverting the masculine and feminine in oneself. Homosexuality appeared as one of the forms of sexuality when it was transposed from practice of sodomy onto a kind of interior androgyny, her a hermaphroditism of the soul. The sodomite had been a temporary aberration. The homosexual was now a species. So the point is that before the 1860s or 1870, that homosexuality was looked upon as, as something a person could do, but it did not define the person as a sort of identity. Well, this is unfortunately not entirely correct, because as chapter 10 of Guerrero points out, in the 4th century, when the Christians took over Christian, or when the when the Christians took over the Roman Empire, they divided between non-procreative sex and procreative sex. And the non-procreative sex was because all same sex is non-procreative. That was the non-procreative sex, and procreative sex was heterosexual sex. 
Um, and I, I go into more detail in chapter 10 about that, but it, it was, it certainly was not until the 1800s that people made this distinction between procreation, non-procreation. All they did was they basically came up with new words for the concept that had already existed. Let's see here. Uh, the second point was that uh, they said that as, as homosexuality became pathologized in the 20th century, uh, because of that, they, that's why you don't see men with the same kind of uh, intimacy and, and you don't see men holding hands and you don't see men taking pictures with each other because they don't want to be thought of as gay. This is also false. Uh, homosexuality or same-sex acts before the word homosexuality came around was pathologized and criminalized. Uh, in fact, that's how same-sex homosexuality got its start, was it was criminalized in the fourth century. They said that if two men have sex with each other, regardless of the context, regardless of the fact that, you know, relationships between men are totally different, so it's not just one kind of homosexuality, you can have very many different types. Uh, the Christians in the fourth century, they criminalized it, and that created uh, already a sort of pathology and criminalization. So that had already been in place. So the question is, why is it that uh, until the 20th century and mid-20th century, only then did men start to not be as friendly and intimate with each other as the picture show? And what I've argued for in chapter 12 was, in the Gore Vidal section, was that in the 1950s and 60s, as gays became more prominent on television, their effeminacy uh, turned off other men from same-sex sex. Okay, so we we at Grero make the distinction between gay and same-sex uh, relationships. Gay is one kind of way to have same-sex relationships. Uh, gay men tend to be more effeminate, true to the stereotype, and as a result. Since gay men were the only ones who were on TV in the 1950s and 60s, any kind of same-sex relationships became associated with effeminacy, and masculine men did not want to be part of that. Uh, again, that's in Chapter 12 uh, in the Gore Vidal section. Um, and what I, what I said was before, before the association with effeminacy of, of all same-sex sex, the conflation of all same-sex sex with effeminacy, it was a taboo. I mean, it was criminalized, but it, it was such a taboo that it wasn't. Okay, that a lot of men, the Kinsey numbers in, in the 1940s, Kinsey found that one third of men were having sex with other men. Okay, not all the time, intermittently, but it certainly is more than what you have today, and that's because there was no stigma of effeminacy associated with same sex sex. It was just criminalized, but it was not thought of as an effeminate sort of thing. I think that's what uh, dropped the numbers uh, of, of men who, who want to have sex with other men. Um, let's see here. So, they, and they, they also say what, what you see in the photographs was common, not rare. The photos are not about sexuality, but intimacy. Well, the other point that I've made a couple times before, that what Guerrero tries to do is it tries to break down the wall between, um, between friends and sex. And that's not to say friends will always have sex, uh, friends will always be sexual, but that it could be. Okay, um, so so now the question then becomes, why is it that these men were more intimate in those days? It could very well be that the wall between friends and sex was shifted towards the more, uh, uh, more, it was, it was shifted more towards the, you can hold hands, but you still can't have sex side of things, or that some of these men did have sex with each, uh, with other men. And we do know that before the uh, association with effeminacy, more men did have sex with other men. And it wasn't looked upon as, I mean, it was criminalized, you didn't want to get caught, but men did not recoil from same-sex sex with other men before the 50s and 60s. So anyways, it, it, it's just that, the, just to explain that wall a little bit more, right now we have a wall between friends and sex. So if there's two... Uh, more or less normal guys, they can be friends, but they can never have sex, because that's gay, you know, that's effeminate. Uh, so Guerrero is about, re uh, is eliminating that wall, which doesn't mean that friends will always be having sex, but that they could be having sex. Okay, so the next article 
here. Or, oh boy, we're running out of time here. Okay, so there's a, another article called Global Psyche, a hands-on approach. Uh, and it involves a, a, um, an African psychiatrist who went back to his home country and was shocked by the fact that men were holding hands. And he had lived there before, but, you know, being in America, he said that he internalized the, um, he internalized American taboos against same-sex affection for men. And what he, what he says is, in much of the Middle East and Africa, homosexuality is taboo and rarely acknowledged. So straight men feel free to show affection in part because no one will assume that they're gay. Well, again, I think this goes back to the, um, the wall analogy that I use. Namely that in many of these cultures, there very well could be, a lot of these men could very well be having sex. And as the other articles show, a lot of men are having sex. Uh, so it's just that their, their cultural walls are, are a little different. As long as you, you're not uh, open about having sex with other men, you can do whatever you want in the back. Basically, that's the attitude, I think, that... Um, that uh, that this gentleman is talking about. Let's see. Do we have a? Let's skip that article for now. Okay. So uh, holding hands uh, in many places throughout Asia, holding hands amongst men is considered a common demonstration of hetero friendship. While crossing chaotic streets or sauntering down the sidewalk chewing a pawn, uh, Indian men show no shame in interlocking fingers and pressing palms. In America, though, hand-holding between male friends is strictly prohibited by heteronormative social norms. Lifting weights together in sleeveless tees and making eye contact in the full-body mirror at the gym while executing synchronized bicep curls is allowed. But hand-holding between close friends, no, that'd be totally gay. If you are an Indian male visiting family in India, do not be alarmed if upon first meeting you after several years of absence, your cousin, uh whatever, immediately grabs your hand and holds it next to his thigh for a long period of time. Also, do not be alarmed if he is several years older than you, pushing 30, living with his parents, and still single. This is the Indian custom of saying, How have you been, brother? I'm not allowed to touch girls in my family's presence, so this is as good as it gets. Well, you know, this is the, the usual, let's ruin things with situational homosexuality. So it, it's because there's no women around and uh, women are not allowed, that men are attracted to other men. Um, uh, I go, go into the details in that in chapter 8, so I won't repeat that, uh, chapter 7 and 8, so I won't repeat that here. Uh, let's see, I think we have time for one more. Uh, showing some love. Uh, the next article. So, the article shows, a, shows two black guys, uh, they're probably not gay, one's kind of sleeping in the arms of the other on the subway, and there's lots of negative comments uh, on on the site where the picture is hosted, and it's like, oh, this is intolerable, and, and it's a lot of homophobic comments. And the comment on this page with the picture says, there's no excuse for the homophobia that exists in many parts of both the developed and the developing world, but it really does seem like the U.S. is unique in its inability to tolerate any of the display of affection between men that goes beyond the handshake or a thump on the back. We even have words for it, bro hugs and the like, in order to distinguish, to distinguish it from what might be deemed unmanly displays. Well, yeah, I mean, I've talked about this before, bro hugs or bromance. Uh, you know, there's this, to dismiss any, con well, let's, tr let's try that again. This is a way of shifting the wall of, uh, between friends and sex, to where it's okay, you can you can kind of touch another guy, you can hug another guy, but you can't, you still can't have sex with him. So it kind of shifts that wall of of physical intimacy. It gets people a little closer, but it's still sex between men is still not allowed. Now, as I've m mentioned in another video, um, calling it a bromance kind of gives it away because if the whole point is it's not about sex then why are you making it about sex? By, by signifying that it's a, a cutesy little romance that says that, it's, that it, sex could be there. So it's kind of ironic. Uh, we'll continue this in another video.